Hi, everybody. This is San Diego Comic Con Online. This is the Image Comics virtual panel for character. Uh, my name is Marla Isaac. I'm the executive assistant at Image Comics, and I have all these amazing creators here to talk about character. Uh, thanks so much for joining everyone on our virtual call. Um, very different from these in person Comic Cons that I know we're all used to. Um, I guess I'll just go around and introduce everybody. Today we have Danny. She's working on Coffin Bound. Hello. Jeff Lemire. Uh, he's working on Gideon Falls, Asunder Family Tree. Uh, David Walker with Bitterroot. Darcy Van Bolkeest uh, with Little Bird. And Kit Seaton with Norway. And Johnny Christmas with Tartarus. Hey. Yay, we're all here. How are you all doing with quarantine and uh, being at home all the time? Very different from normal San Diego. Yeah, but the rest of the year I'm home all the time anyway, so this is not that. Yeah, different. it seems like for a lot of creators, this is like obviously tricky, but yeah. day by day, it's kind of the same. Yeah, Preparing business as usual. Whole life. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's nice to be able to do this and not have to put on pants, as opposed to if I was at San Diego, I'd have to be fully dressed. And I haven't but, brushed my teeth yet either today. So that's <laughs> really good thing. And no one will ever know. They'll never know. <laughs> Until now. Yeah. But it's like the whole world is facing the comic tonight. Yeah. Everyone is staying at home. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, everybody is kind of like, uh, this is a huge thing for me. And you guys are like, well, nah. eh. <laughs> it's not that huge. No, it, it's, I, I found the, the first bit of, time, bit of quarantine time incredibly productive because um, the world sort of shut down uh -huh. around me. And I just felt like I could do what I, you know, I, there was no interruptions because the, the world turned off. Um, but then I just, I, now I'm getting into the territory of being just, kind of annoyed it with myself, just spending so much time. Totally. With them. Um, and I've got two kids, as I mentioned before we started recording, and you know, they like to pop up into my office and try and throw me off. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's been all right. Yeah, I know I was very productive for the first month or so, and then I also got very bored and over it and wanting to hang out with people. <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm so, I'm the exact opposite of being productive right now, which is really frustrating to me. And, um, and I beat myself up every day. So as, as much Aww. as writers would beat themselves up anyway, I'm, I've turned it up to like 11, but um, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it, like with this panel and, and what Comic-Con's doing, it's, it's refreshing and revitalizing to see the community trying to, figure out how to maneuver these waters, you know? It, totally. It's, um, there's people, I, I, I was really stressed out and depressed about not getting to see people in San Diego. I mean, I've, I've gone for 20 something years now. Wow. And, uh, and so now it's like, at least there's some interaction going on. And it's, and, and cause as Darcy was saying, as we're joking about, you know, it's not that different being stuck at home. Um, the things that the one of the big changes is we're not going to conventions we're not interacting with people on that level so it, you know for me it's like you know i'm home every day for three or four weeks and then i go to a convention i get all my social interaction in for a month then it's another convention so on and so forth and so this is this is honestly that's the hardest part for me has been adjusting on this level mm. yeah i mean conventions every year one each month? I do, I do about, I'd be 10 to 15 a year, yeah, per wow. year. Oh, man. Wow. Which, is, which is a lot. <laughs> oh. I, that would literally kill me, I think. Yeah, your if, immune if, system must be amazing. If yeah, I do well. two, it's, it's enough. Um, and I'm new to all this, too, and I, I just feel, I just find conventions um, overwhelming. I can't, I'm not good at them, whatever that means, so <laughs> I... It hasn't, uh, it's just been kind of normal for me, I guess. 
yeah, it's a, it's definitely different than, I mean, and it's interesting because I hit, I'd hit a point where I was thinking sometime in 2022, I wanted to phase out going to conventions because I go to so many every year. And now it's like, oh no, it's, that ain't going to happen because they're just going to be starting up again, just as I was ready to retire from yeah. the <laughs> circuit. So right. at least another year or two. Yeah. That off. Yeah. But it's weird, like, how will conventions change after this? I kind of think they have to change pretty drastically, even if we get a vaccine and, and everything kind of starts to get a new normal. I don't know if they can continue going on in the same way they have. I don't know. But we'll yeah, see it's going to be pretty drastic. And I think just even the, the comic industry as a whole, entertainment industry as a whole, is we're, we're figuring it out. I mean, every day I wake up and have a mini freak out, sometimes a major freak out. Yeah. There's a lot going on right now. So it's, it's, mm. it has to change every industry. Um, well, talking about character, um, I guess I'm kind of curious from the beginning, when you do, when you start researching for a story, do you find that your characters drive your research? Or does your research kind of ever end up shaping your character in a totally different way than what you had anticipated going into that research? Does that make sense? What's the research? Is yeah. That no. no. Do you do any research? <laughs> no, never. What is that? <laughs> I write stuff. I just make stuff up. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, my, my stuff always starts with the characters and then like the, usually it's like a, almost all my stories start from some kind of a core emotional relationship between a couple characters or, or like a character that I've drawn in my sketchbook or something. And then Definitely. the worlds and everything else, I'll, I'll just kind of come from that. So it's always how I've sort of approached the story. Mm -hmm. um, never, never really, I never really have like a, a concept or a theme or anything. And then, and then do research or, or build the world and find the characters. It's always the other way around for me. And there's, do you find that that character comes to you kind of like fully formed too, or is it just kind of like a little germ of an um, idea? Just like a little spark, like a, it's like a feeling almost of what they feel like, <laughs> if that yeah. makes sense, like emotionally or something. Totally. And you just try to keep that little spark alive in every, in every issue or every, you know, like um, it's hard to explain. It's almost like an intuition thing where you just kind of get a little feeling of what a character feels like and you try to be true to that feeling. And when you start writing something that doesn't feel true to that, yeah. you can tell and you kind of have to go back. And it's just sort of a process like that, keeping that little spark of your original concept or whatever alive through however many issues or however long your story is. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's, um, well, I, I tend to talk in the voices of, the characters as I'm writing, I have, you know, I'll have a voice like this or a voice like it's very weird <laughs> and unsettling if anyone overhears me, but um, they, every character I create is really just, there's bits and pieces of a few key people in my life that their personalities inform the character and, and because each of us is so complex as a person, I might take just like the sense of humor of this one person for one character, but then maybe they're a quirky habit they have while they're eating hot dogs or something for, for another character. Um, but as Jeff was saying, like, for me, that, that emotional core, that emotional spark, intellectual spark is, um, becomes so important that if I, if I feel like I'm creatively stuck in a story, I will just, I'll just sit there and sort of say, okay, so what do you want to do right now? You know, it's like, I'm, it's like almost talking to a friend or a relative, um, mm. you know, you know, and, and from there I tell people that, you know, my characters talk to me and they'll tell me if I'm, if I'm doing something wrong, like, um, I feel like I'm just the conduit through which their story is being told. Mm. Yeah. I like when they, uh, surprise me through action. Uh, a lot of times I, I, I know who my character is. Like I know who they are inside, but mm -hmm. I really know who they are when they start doing stuff. So as I sort of describe action or um, uh, a scenario that they're in and the way they react to it um, tells me a whole lot about them. And um, uh, 
much like David and Jeff were saying, like if it's not uh, if it's not true, then it just just doesn't fit. It's like a bad jigsaw jigsaw piece. Uh, but when it is true, it just kind of changes everything because it's it's just true. Um, uh, and sometimes with uh, and and that's kind of where I start as well with the characters. And sometimes I'll I'll go and do research way after because I've mm. found that if uh, you do research beforehand, you get really proud of the research and you want to start like showing off all the cool oh, stuff. Totally. You found, and it's just it's, <laughs> it's the worst. So uh, so I usually leave any research to way in the end, and then I try and find uh, then that just sort of enhances the world more so than. Yeah. Uh, enhancing the characters. So you kind of write it out just like as a, as a story, where the character is going, what their actions are, and then kind of weave in the historical bits. Absolutely. Later. Yeah, like everything is character. Yeah. Like uh, what they want, what they feel, what they don't want. Um, and then everything else is just uh, beautiful dressing around that. Uh, and then watching them interact with that world is kind of cool too. Um, but it's all about um, their, their like deep core drives, desires. Johnny, I want to come live in your house, by the way. It's so nice. <laughs> I wish this was my Hi. house. It's an illusion. It's not his. <laughs> no, it's a, I, I'm hiding out uh, in the Gulf Islands. I'm trying to get some writing done. Kit, what about for you? Does the research ever inform your character building? Or yeah. Or the um, around? Well, for the for the most part, I um, I've kind of been collaborating with other authors, so that means that the text is already supplied. Um, one of the things that uh, I think where research really kind of helps me the most, and this is kind of coming from the old sort of costume design camp, is that you start with analyzing the script, and uh, one of the things that you try to figure out right, right away is how you can set certain limitations for the design. So that could be even as much as the character's choices and how those characters' choices have consequences and by those consequences, their options become more and more limited and that kind of helps you refine things down a little bit. That character's emotional state is gonna determine a lot about how you physically represent that character, uh, whether or not their, their presentation is higher, they're looking a little disheveled. Um, I'm oftentimes also informed a lot by uh, history since that's kind of our you know, our main sort of source to draw from. Um, and uh, so I, I'll sometimes go through, back through my old history books or my old theater books to find a germ of an idea for inspiration. But um, that usually just kind of starts as a loose framework because as Johnny said, it's really easy just to get caught up in the minutia. But um, again, I, I like to keep, so, so like for example, my old costume design mentor gave me like a bunch of these old books that have, um, I'm going to do show and tell here. So yeah. like old uh, theater books, uh, that's a Garfield. Uh, <laughs> I thought that looked like Garfield, yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, masks and things like that, these historical resources can become like a great jumping off point for an idea. Um, like a really cool one, well, this one, this is on cartoons and characters, but like one of my special interests when I was a kid was Commedia dell'arte. So um, yeah, and I think, Theater and, and it, well, that physicality that came from theater informed a lot of my design work and, and how I think about clothing and how the costume informs the character. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's set dressing. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think my, my role primarily, at least from how I've gained entry into comics has been kind of from that aesthetical angle. It's one of those things where you don't want to overthink it. Like if you're saying like, oh, this, pocket square that this guy wears in his pocket is a total symbolic metaphor for something that happens in chapter nine you might be getting into the weeds a little bit yeah but uh in general it's a it's a fun kind of jumping off point and some of that can add just a little bit of you know seasoning throughout so without getting without rambling there we go <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting i think it's really interesting that you, interesting that you are connecting theater with comics yeah um, but they have like a really big connection, at least from my head, in my head as well. And yeah. I saw this um, in the university. I was uh, studying fine arts, and one part, uh, one course was I don't know how it's in English. So if someone knows the <laughs> correct name, scenography. Yeah. You know? yeah. When you analyze the theater, and then you make all the visuals and mm -hmm. how it's a uh, theatrical play and how it's going to turn out. And this for me has um, 
really influenced the way I build characters and know that the square thing is a symbol for me, even if no one. <laughs> it is important. Look, <laughs> it is important. <laughs> I have my pet things too. Like it has to be in there every time. <laughs> so. Well, and I, it's it, going back to talking about the connection between theater and and comics. You know, Will Eisner's dad worked in, in theater in the Yiddish theater, and that was where he was exposed to art. And um, and if you like, if you study Will Eisner's work, and Will Eisner being one of the the foundations upon which our, our medium is built, our craft is built, you can see that he learned expression through theater. He learned how mm -hmm. to emote and all that. And and so I, I think about that a lot too, because in theater, you know, the first rule of, one of the first rules of theater is, you know, you have to play to the back of the house. People have to understand what emotion is. And, and, and I think about that a lot as I'm writing and I will say, you know, a lot of times in my panel descriptions to the artists, the most important thing is that emotion, right? Because it's easy to say Batman punches Joker, right? But it's like, how do you say, you know, this character is feeling remorse or pain? And, and how do you sell that to the reader? Because you don't want, we live in an era of comics now where you don't want the character you don't want a thought balloon or something of the character going, oh, I feel so guilty over all the things that I've done, right? Um, it, we don't want to spell it out, but in some ways we do have to spell it out and how can we do that visually? But, uh, you know, I, I feel like as, as part of a team, part of a creative team and as the, the I guess for lack of a better term, the, the person who starts that process rolling along the storytelling process, it's really my responsibility to think about this and to convey it to the artist in a way that um, that they get so that they can translate this idea in, in, into that language that, that the readers will understand. Yeah, I think that reminds me of my, uh, my old professor, Bunny Carter uh, said was that there's, there's two main things in design that really are the most important is that you gotta keep it clear and it's gotta be interesting. So I always thought that that was great because it was just like, it was a way at least from a, a visual perspective, you know, if you could ask yourself and answer those two questions and usually you were on the right track. Darcy, what about you? Do you have anything or any, any way that you start with research for a character or does it just kind of pop up? Well, I really don't like research. I try and avoid it at all costs. Um, but no, it, it starts with a, it always starts with a character. Um, I, going back to what Jeff said at the beginning, I, I rarely um, think about concepts or anything in the early stages. All that gets built around the conflict that I want the character to experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it very much starts with that person and they, um, they tend to just sort of show up um, and ask for the story to be told, I feel like, and um, that's how it starts. And then mm -hmm. it, it builds out from there. I'm curious also if any of you, and, and Darcy, you can answer this first if you want, um, sure. if you have a technique for making characters more memorable, or is it just the action guides the character and that's what makes them stand out? Uh, this is something I actually think a lot about, and only because I feel like um, it's still something that could be improved in comics in general. I quite often will pick up first issues and read it. And by the end of it, even though, you know, amazing world, incredible art, you know, like everything seems to be there, but I have no desire to go pick up the second issue. And mm -hmm. I, often that always comes back to that. I just didn't make a connection with the character. Mm -hmm. um, I think those first issues are, you know, crucial and, and um, presenting a character that readers can relate to and feel involved with, you know, a relationship forms in that, that first 
part of the story. Yeah. That's what gets them to, to stay and to keep reading. And I think sometimes we fool ourselves in that, like, it's a, it's about really smart concepts or, um, the amazing art or, I mean, all those are a part of it, but I think if you, if they, at least for myself, I don't care about the character. I just can't do it. Yeah. Um, so that really is where I put almost all my energy in, in terms of the initial stages of developing something. Um, I don't, was that your question? I have no yeah. idea. Right? Okay. No, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I think it's, it's the most important thing, you know, and, mm. and they're always, and I also like to start my stories as late as possible. Like I like to just drop in. I don't want a lot of build up, And that actually is mm -hmm. completely in conflict with the idea of, of, of readers spending time with a character so that they can build a relationship with them. Those two things butt heads. So it's a, there's a balance there um and i think that's where yeah. a lot of the work comes in at least in the beginning of the story yeah. i love the super super simple motivation like have you had that uh, that thing where you're just trying to get a copy or trying to go to work and everything goes wrong in your day i like that sort of thing in in uh in comics where someone just wants something very simple very relatable yeah. just elemental and just everything goes wrong and it's like it's like the worst day on earth but you know stretched out over the course of this this uh extended dilemma you know it's this extended uh well as scott mcleod said something about uh story is a uh, is a uh, desire it's like the life cycle of a desire basically is what your story is mm -hmm. so this person just trying to satisfy this desire and everything going wrong until it goes right um and that's your end so uh so i like to keep it as simple as possible so that way it's super relatable and and um your your audience has extreme empathy because they've been there no matter if it's on an alien world or if it's in 1940s whenever like it's 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 them you know that core element is still there. yeah yeah i tend to think of it as um with character and, and getting your reader to invest. And I agree with, with what Darcy was saying is that I treat the first chapter or the first issue of every story that I'm doing, the, the most simple and ridiculous comparisons, I treat it like a date and I'm, I'm on a date with my reader and I want to go on a second date with them. Maybe I want to marry them. Maybe, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and um, cause we've all been on those dates where like, you're like, yeah, I'm just not feeling it. And you don't come back, you know, maybe there's something about that person that attracted you, that interested you initially, but by the end of, you know, an evening of hanging out or whatever, you're just like, yeah, th there's just no spark here. And so I, I think about that a lot. It's, I, I don't need <clears throat> like a really strong cliffhanger at the end of a first issue. I need to feel like I, I know this person or these people and then I'm invested in wherever it is that they're going. And, 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 it, and it could be as simple as getting a cup of coffee or it could be as complex as dealing with the, the, you know, the grief of, of having lost, you know, a loved one. And, um, but I, I, I'm very big on the relationship between the creative team and the audience and knowing that the audience is the final member of the team. We, we create mm -hmm. comics, um, we, we write them, we draw them, we ink them, we edit them, we do all these things, and then we hand them over to other people, and then we go, now this is yours to do with what you will, and, and if it's successful, the reader internalizes it in some capacity, they become invested in it, it's, you know, and the best books do that so quickly, I think of like, um, like Saga with, um, you know, Brian K. Vaughan and Fiona Staples. And, um, and it's interesting because it's like, they're reprehensible characters that you're still invested in. There's characters that you, you wouldn't like, but you're still like, what are they gonna do next? And, and they, whenever that, that book in particular, I teach that one to my students and I say, read this because every character that you meet, you, they stick with you in some capacity. You become invested in them for better or worse. Because sometimes, you know, you take like a villain, like say Darth Vader, 
and you're kind of invested in that villain, like whether you're invested in seeing their downfall or their redemption. And, and that's, that's a huge thing. I, I, I want to see, I want to see the journey of the villain more than the hero, the journey of the hero at this point in my life, because I think that that's more, far more fascinating. Um, but it is, it's, it's all about, it's all about wowing somebody on that first date and making them just think they can't live without you. Jeff, what about for you? Um, sorry, what was the, what was like the actual question we're talking about? <laughs> How do you, or do you have a technique for making a character um, memorable or making that connection? Yeah, I mean, yeah, not really. I think it, it differs from project to project. Sometimes, um, sometimes there'll be something visual about the character that makes them instantly recognizable. Like when I did Sweet Tooth, it was just, you know, he obviously was, had something specific about him. But, and then there's other times where you, you can make mistakes by trying to add too many quirks to characters to make them quirky or memorable. And sometimes you just gotta let them be human, you know, and just, just have, uh, like Darcy said, just the best way to make them memorable is to have scenes, the first scene with them or the first scenes in the is first issue with them um, be emotional uh, scenes so that the, the, the readers invest in those characters. And mm -hmm. that's, that's like real investment and not, not artificial things you put onto them, you know? Um, so yeah, there's no, certainly no formula or anything, but um, I guess you just, yeah, it, you try to emotionally connect with the reader through those characters as early as you can so they get invested. Mm -hmm. What about you, Danny? Do you have a, a way to do that? Yeah, I don't know what else to add to all of these, but I, I have something like a question, I don't know, uh, like, do you think, all of you, that in comics, um, we have many examples of um, creators, not creators specifically, but people giving more um, attention to the, the visual, because I feel like this is maybe because of superhero comics, I don't know, like, they were um, really visually different from each other, uh, because they have these traits. Uh, this was uh, Mr. Red, I don't know, this was uh, whatever. And um, like, this is somehow evolving now, and we are trying to make more, uh, even if the character is simple, like, I don't know, just the girl with the blonde hair and the shirt, and just make her story more interesting and uh, relatable. I don't know. <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm just adding something and I'm asking if you think this is because of superheroes maybe? Oh my god. <laughs> That's a good question. I personally, I think a lot of it is just the evolution of this, this medium that we're, that we're working in and that um, for a long time comics have been thought of as things for kids and, and they're not and they can be, but, um, and I don't want to speak for anybody else in this group, but I constantly find, find myself challenging my own thought processes. How can I do something that I haven't seen before or I haven't seen in a long time? How can I get this across? How can I show, again, how can I show this emotion? How do you, how do you show regret in a comic? How do you show a character going through regret without telling the reader that they're going through regret how do you how right. do you convey that how do you and, and these are the things that i think about and i get this matt fraction and i talk about these things like reverse engineering stuff so i'll watch a movie and i'll see a scene in a movie and think okay how can i make this happen in a comic without sound without music without all of the cues that that film gives us to know that we're supposed to feel something you're supposed to feel sad in a movie when the strings come in and the lighting gets a certain way but how do you how do you achieve that in comics and I think that that's sort of that, that maybe that's part of what you're talking about like I love this medium so much but I also don't want to see it stay where it was when I was 10 years old and you know getting um you know, X-Men for the first time and, and, and loving that book, but knowing, you know, 30 years later, it's like, oh, there's, we can do something more complex with the X-Men than 
what's been done. And, and if you aren't allowed to work on the X-Men or you don't get that opportunity, you do it with your own stuff, which is why I, I love doing, you know, my own titles or, or titles that I'm working on with other people. I should say that for companies like Image, where it's like, um, because you have that room and that opportunity to figure out how to show regret in a comic and you don't have an editor saying, well, you know, Spider-Man should really say, I regret not stopping the burglar who <laughs> killed my Uncle Ben, and now I'm filled with angst. And, you know, it's like, I don't want that. Show it to me, but don't tell it to me. I, I come from a film background, so it's, this is like, wh one of the things I remember in film school is that my instructor saying, um, watch films with no sound. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a really great, um, tool when we're talking about comics too because we don't have the advantage of storytelling through sound and music and all those other things which are huge emotional drivers um, so and when you do watch a film you really you start to really see how the close-up of the flowers in between these two shots you know fills in a really big emotional beat that you would have missed otherwise and um and to me, that's where comics really thrive. You know, they can almost do that better than film because they not only <clears throat> are they a visual medium, but they're only a visual medium, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. I think that, um, I don't know why I'm necessarily drawing that comparison, but it, it just came to mind that, um, that, you know, because it is a visual medium, it can, it can own it in a way that I don't think any other can. Um, and I think a lot of the growth in comics is going to come from expanding genre into new audiences because superheroes kind of just pass through a phase in life. But if you go to Europe, I mean, the, you, you walk into a store that sells um, comics, graphic novels. I mean, it's like historical fiction, romance. I mean, it's just like literally is something for everyone. It's right. um, so I think on that side, there's room for growth here, which I think is the most exciting thing about comics right now. Um, but also, I think there's still tons of room to grow in terms of how we tell stories visually too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of what David was saying. Yeah, that's always my least favorite thing. I always get so angry, especially in like superhero movies where like the music swells and it's like this, it's, it's artificial emotion. Because I'm just like, no, I don't, I don't feel anything for this character. I don't care about Captain America right now. Like, why are you trying to make me feel something towards him with this, like, audio yeah, cue? Yeah, music, that feels manipulative. Especially yeah, exactly. <laughs> so annoying. Yeah, in, in a sense, it's all manipulative, but we just don't have the tools in comics. We don't, our, our tool belt only has a couple things in it. Yeah. Um, compared to the films, hammer and a saw. Just, we are master <laughs> manipulators. <laughs> yeah, you have to get really creative with your manipulation, basically. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. Um, another question I had was, I guess when you started creating, when you started writing or drawing, um, was there a character that you came across that you thought was a total game changer? Like, holy crap, I didn't know that it could be this way. Um, I didn't know that you could have this in a comic, I guess. Either when you were young or when, or even recently, the, a new series that you read that kind of blew your mind a little. Uh, what, what immediately came to mind is, and I don't remember how to pronounce his name, but the, uh, the character from, uh, from Hell, the police the detective dude who's trying to solve the crimes. Oh. Um, the fact that he was like, this um, this kind of middle-aged dude who uh, didn't have anything particularly noteworthy about him, and he was trying to solve this crime, and he didn't. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean that's <laughs> and he failed. And he failed, and that, <laughs> that you could do that, and yeah. you're following him the whole time, and you're 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 um you're following with interest the whole time was um was amazing to me that you can do that in the story. And, and 700 pages later, or And 700 seriously. pages later, so he doesn't solve the crime, you know? Um, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, that, that, that was a game changer for me. 
For me, when I was a kid, it was Animal Man. I, I, I say the same thing in every interview I've ever done because I just, I was really, I mean, I was a big DC comic reader as a kid and, you know, I was reading basically everything they put out, you know, that's, I spent all my allowance on that. And, but uh, picking up Animal Man and like how, the, you know, he's experimenting with the form and the character was like stepping out of the panels and talking to the writer, you know, it's Grant Morrison. And I was just like, I don't know what this is, but it's the greatest thing ever. And I put them all up on my wall and I slept under them every night. <laughs> and, uh, that was, that was the life changing comic mm -hmm. experience for me. Well, actually, let me, let me amend what I said. There is the truth is the truth does come out, but justice isn't served at the end. Of right. The Just in I, case someone tests you on your. Phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll embarrass him by saying this. Um, there was, uh, in an early issue of powers by Brian Bendis and Mike Oming, um, there's a, a character, I, I think it's the character Zora, spoiler alert, it's 20 something years later, <laughs> dies, right? And, and um, she dies and, and somebody says to, to, to Walker, who's the, the lead character, oh, did you know her? And he says, she was my fiance. And it's the way Mike drew it, and it's the way that Brian wrote it. And I remember reading that and going, holy crap, it was like, like it was soul crushing this moment. And yet we didn't know any of this backstory. And it was amazing to me, the economy of storytelling that you could have and just the look on this character's face. And, and Mike draws in a, in a style that's, um, that's deceptively simple. It looks like it'd be easy to do, and but it's not, and it, it carries a lot of emotion. Going back to what we were talking about, theater, right? And then, but to say when someone says, "Oh, this person died. Did you know them?" And then this other person just says, "That she was my fiance." There's a whole story there. There's a whole book there, and and I had read that. You know, I, I'm now great friends with both creators, and that. I met them right after that issue came out and I was talking to them about the impact of that and that how I didn't really know you could do something this powerful in comics. And so I think about that sort of stuff all the time. I, I, I think about um, how much can you reveal without revealing almost anything at all. And it's a, um, I call it the John Carpenter trick because if you watch some of John Carpenter's best movies, um, in, in his better movies, he's a master getting you to be in, emotionally invested in a character that you know nothing about. And and if you've ever seen The Thing, his, his 1981-82 movie, The Thing, when you think about it, you don't know anything about any of those characters. You don't know if any of them are married. You don't know if any of them have kids. You don't know what their life is like outside of this Antarctic research station. But you're for 90 minutes you're riveted who's who's gonna live who's gonna die who's the thing who's not the thing how are they gonna get out of there and it's like there's nothing about any of them and and to me that's like how do you do that how do you make a, a story that you barely know anything about them maybe a single line of dialogue tells you something but that line of dialogue speaks volumes and, and i think in comics where the economy of space is always crucial every word means so much because the difference between a 25 word sentence and a 10 word sentence is half the panel that you have. And it's, you know, how much are you gonna have to cover? How much of the art are you gonna have to cover? How many panels can you fit into a single page? How many pages can make a scene? And so part of the craft of, of comics, which is what I love, are all of these restrictions that we have that, you know, when done right, make you go, oh my God, which is what, that issue of powers did. Hmm. Kit, did you have one growing up? Well, um, it's kind of funny because I think uh, my earliest memories of reading in general and how I learned to read was on comic strips. So, you know, I think I started with Garfield and Peanuts. And then I think when I was about six years old is when I first got my first Calvin and Hobbes collection. So I think that was pretty much, I mean, and I would read obsessively just that, because I think there was something that Watterson was so good, just in that kind of very quick, 
immediate way he could you know capture all kinds of feelings i think we all remember that like really notorious like the the raccoon <laughs> the baby raccoon that they find in the woods oh. out like from a comic yeah he could he could do something that would make you laugh hysterically and the next one he would like wrench your heart out and as you get older you find out that there's so many more layers of, of subtext and meaning that you know he was exploring uh, in that comic and the world felt rich and vibrant but then also could be incredibly playful and it would switch from like Calvin imagining he's a dinosaur and terrorizing uh, the city of New York. So I think that that taught me as a little kid is that it was okay to be uh, imaginative and weird whereas like growing up like those were two things that were not always usually okay was to be the weird imaginative kid in class. So um, I think that, yeah, that had a huge impact on me. I think ever after that, I've always been kind of looking for comics that could kind of fulfill that need. You know, it's always that thing about I'm looking for a particular tone. I'm looking to try to feel a particular way that there's some sort of need, you know, something I'm trying to solve, maybe internally. And I think we look for stories that could fill that void. I think the one that most recently, like, really kind of serve that it was odd because they're you know i find that i really love the strips just because of the immediacy of that you want to talk about how comics are already a truncated medium but i think of amanda dollywall's uh woman world and how the, it's such a fun concept it's just a bizarre concept like what if something happened and, and men just sort of stopped happening and the women were like what <laughs> so, and then making a comment about that and now she's got a great series that she's doing on instagram which is just all about cyclopses and it's like to be a cyclops in a world full of two eyes and so i think <laughs> yeah it's a it i always love i think i think i'm drawn a lot to humor and it's one of those things that i don't always get to explore very much in, in my work um because i, I do kind of end up I think the other thing that had a huge influence on me growing up was like things like Crawl and <laughs> all those weird like sci-fi movies from the 80s and fantasy movies like Legend and stuff like that. So I tend to do a lot of stuff with hopefully some kind of funny thrown in. But yeah. uh, I really love the kind of comedic comic medium. I think that was something I was always trying to look for. Something that would make me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say when you said Crawl, I, <laughs> at first I thought, oh no, she, she has to mean cull, you know? She's oh, got to mean the oh. Robert E. Howard character because nobody is going to reference crawl. Yep, you did. <laughs> you win. This panel is officially yours. <laughs> well, I think the first time I watched crawl was right around the time, and I was like a little kid, like eight or nine, was also when I discovered that ElfQuest was a thing because I think my, one of, my mom was a high school theater teacher, and I think her students gave her a bunch of comics uh, for me to read, because I like, we heard your kid likes comics, so they, they all like, get, they, this guy gave me a collection of stuff that was going to blow a seven-year-old's mind, um, and yeah, Elf Quest certainly <laughs> blew my mind, so there was that, and Curl, and Legend, and oh uh, gosh, I don't know, Willow, <sighs> yeah, that, so that kind of is a slurry that's in my brain, mixed in with Calvin and Hobbes, <laughs> that's and a great slurry, <laughs> that's an excellent slurry, no, it is, and I mean, Elf Quest, to me, because I'm older, I mean, I remember when ElfQuest first came out, and mm -hmm. and so I, I got the first issue of ElfQuest, and was like, you can do this with comics? You know, I was yeah. probably like 12 at the time. So if we want to go even further back, um, I think that, like, that was a crucial moment, because that was, um, with the exception of the, the spirit magazines that I had gotten in the 70s that um, I want to say Warren put out, um, ElfQuest was the first, you know, I guess, non-superhero thing that I had read. And, and I discovered that book going to a comic convention in New York City when I was a kid where I met the Pinnies. So it was like, not only was that the first time I'd really met creators, it was creators that were doing it on their own. It was, and, yeah. and you know, if someone were to ever write my autobiography, they would have to, like, I'm a... I'm a psychotic ElfQuest fan. And, and <laughs> most people are like, what? And it's like, nope, right there on the shelf back there, we've got all the books and I still go to them because, um, and, that, and the lesson, one of the lessons from that is like comics, you should n never restrict yourself to a single genre. You should, you should be reading everything. And, and comic strips too, man, like you've got me thinking about all the Peanuts collections back here, the, the Calvin and Hobbes, um, uh, 
I have a, I have a funky Winker Bean collection, you know. So, uh, like, like I go there, and people are like, "Why would you have a funky Winker Bean collection?" I'm like, "That's some great character right there." Like those, yeah. the, 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 the 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 cancer epic cancer story that they told over oh, like yeah. 20 years is is phenomenal, um, and and comics does not have to be limited to what you think it is because it's always changing and growing and and um people are doing like people do comics on instagram what's instagram you know when i was a kid there was no such thing as as any of this stuff so i i just i get excited when i hear these things and 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 really every almost every time i go to a comic book store which it haven't really been for the most part in the last few months, but I try to buy something I've never seen, mm-hmm. creators I've never heard of, and just what are people doing now? Let's, you know, how can I be inspired? That is, yeah, that's a, and as we start to wrap up, actually, that's one of the questions that I had for all of you. Um, regarding like the future of comics in a year or like two years or five years down the line, when you go to your local comic book shop, what do you want to be seeing? on the shelves? What do you think is kind of missing from comics right now? Or like an area that you think isn't being explored that you think should be? More subjects. Mm. Just, just like, uh, uh, like Darcy was saying, uh, like you go to Europe and you've got, you know, a plethora of subject matter, same with Japan. Uh, and it's, it's happening here and it has been happening here forever, but in a, in a very limited way. Uh, I would like it I would like to see more of it in a in a larger way, like more um, more um, direct market publishers taking on more of that sort of stuff. Um, trade uh, publishers are already there, but if we can have more of it, even in uh, the direct market, it'd be really cool. Mm. I'd like to see more nonfiction. I'd like to see um, not just like biographies and, and memoirs. I'd like to see stuff like um i was just talking to fred van lenti the other day he's working on a graphic novel about the history of basketball you know i i I love reading stuff that is i don't have any interest in the subject matter but it's like oh wow this is kind of cool so there's that thelonious monk graphic novel that came out about a year or two ago which is pretty amazing so it's i'd like to see just i'd like to see people expressing themselves with some honesty and creativity in in things that I would oh I never thought I'd want to read a comic book about the life of Patsy Klein, but if it's done really well it will be awesome. <laughs> yeah that's true like something that you can learn from it stuff that you didn't know before. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> I want the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I also want that. I feel like it's on its way too. Yeah I feel like uh I feel like I mean, I sort of spoke to that already, but I, I feel like more diversity, more diversity in terms of who are telling the stories and more diversity in terms of the subject matter. Um, the, the audience is there. I do believe that. I think it's just a matter of taking the risk and it'll take a bit of time so that people understand that it's there for them, you know, like, um, well, actually Essex County is a great example of like, some that was another sort of epiphany book for me when i read that i was like this is a story about just a kid you know in canada who likes hockey <laughs> you know like um that it, it yeah and that was how long ago did that come out jeff um i think it was uh 2006 yeah yeah so so that's already you know 14 years ago but i think I, I think about that book when I think about um, the future of comics a lot. Mm. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I kind of think it's happening, you know, I, there's already, compared to when I was a kid and the comics that I had access to, it was all just uh, Marvel and DC stuff, really, you know, and, um, there were maybe like you could count the number of sort of notable works, comic works, North American comic works that weren't superhero comics on like one hand, you know, it was like mouse and Harvey Picar stuff and, and a couple others. And, and, and now you go to a bookstore, like I go with my son who's 11 
and he's not really into comics the way I was. Like he's not into like superheroes and, and sort of the genre stuff, but he's just into reading. And he'll re he'll he'll pick up a graphic novel for young readers uh, based on the subject matter or the not because it's a comic, just because he's interested in it. And there's just so much. There's just this, the readers that are growing up like him who are just comics are just there and they're just part of bookstores and part of literature mm -hmm. in a different way. Uh, that's super healthy. So that's I love that. You know, yeah, it's not so ghettoized and limited to one kind of the direct market superhero thing anymore. It's really it really is changing. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more kids who learn how to read because of comics. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's what I would add to is that um, the one thing that actually makes me hopeful for the industry is this kind of larger interest in young adult and even middle reader kind of literature for kids using sequential art comics as the medium because it is a great way to teach kids how to read and the whole reason why we even have a young adult genre is because of librarians and I think the whole thing about you know, graphic novels even being able to flourish with an adult audience or, or a, a kid audience is because of libraries and how much they're pushing that out there. And I think that is exciting because I see in the YA genre, you know, you don't necessarily have to turn away from dark subject matter. You can talk about all the scary themes. They just have to matter and they have to have lasting consequences for the characters. Um, and I think there's also this thing about like once you know, young people realize that they have that as a medium, you know, they're going to continue to love it as they get older and they're going to be looking for, well, like I, like I'm an example of that, always kind of looking for something that's going to fulfill that need. So hopefully that means we're, we're growing audiences. Um, and that's just the thing is that the medium, you know, as we've just talked about today, it's, it's, it's really exciting work and it's an exciting way to tell a story because it has such interesting limitations and hopefully that will just keep readers coming back. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the hope to bring them back. <laughs> Please come back. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much to everybody for joining me and for sticking it out. I really appreciate it. Um, I think that's about it. Hopefully the rest of your summer is okay and you get a chance to connect with other creators online instead of at San Diego. <laughs> well, this is nice. I'm, it's, I know Johnny, but uh, this is the first time I've gotten to meet the, the rest of uh, the panel yeah. here. So I'm glad that we're at least getting the chance to do stuff like this. Yeah. Hey, we're very thing. lucky to have a pandemic during a time of technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all worked. <laughs> Timing was good. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me and having Absolutely. us and everybody out there on the panel and everyone watching. Be safe, be well, yes. and just, you know, try to be nice to each other. That's, that would be the, <laughs> that's the goal. We're in that the is the goal. Yes. Wash your hands, be nice to each other. I like that. <laughs> <laughs>